Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we welcome you to this webinar on the rational choice of antibiotics in pediatric respiratory infection. I have our young pulmonologist with me to answer the queries that we generally have in treating the respiratory infections. My request to all of you will be to mute all your uh, sets now and unmute. You can type at the time of end of the lecture, you can type your questions so that we will try to answer one by one. So without wasting any further time, let us move on to the first slide. Talk is going to be for about one hour. And uh, the first 20 minutes, we'll be spending on the management of upper respiratory tract infections. The next 20 to 25 minutes, we'll be spending on the management of community acquired pneumonias. And the last 20 to 25 uh, minutes or 15 minutes, we will be talking about the management of empyema thoracis and lung abscess. We'll have the next projection. Generally, when we come across a respiratory scenario, the question in our mind is, how old is the child? Is it a nutritionally normal child or an undernourished child? Is its immunological status normal? What is the duration of the illness? And what is the prior antibiotic therapy or history of hospitalization, if any? Then, after examining the child, we come to know what is the bug that is responsible for this common condition. And then, what is the sensitivity of the various antibiotics to the, this bug in your area or locality? And then we formulate a rational antibiotic choice, uh, which must be supported by a literature review. So we'll move on to the first case scenario. It's a four-year-old boy who has been having a fever of five days duration, quite high grade, 103, with coriza and a purulent nasal discharge. And on examination, is systemic examination is normal. And the purulent post-nasal drip, we are able to see when we examine his throat. And he is hemodynamically stable. What's your diagnosis, Dr. Vivek? So when we have a scenario here, like this is a four-year-old boy, high-grade fever with a daytime cough and a purulent discharge, fever extending beyond the third day. And otherwise, systemic, systemic examination is normal. So the commonest diagnosis here which we see is uh, an acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. Now, this is a very important uh, slide where we are given three types of presentations of uh, acute bacterial sinusitis. The one is, first one is with persistent symptoms. That is, whenever there is an nasal congestion with rhinorrhea and a daytime cough, which is lasting for more than 10 days duration without any improvement, then we'll consider a diagnosis of sinusitis, even though there, are, there is no history or documented fever here, prolonged symptoms. The second symptoms is like the present, like the child which we had discussed in the previous slide. Whenever you have severe symptoms, like a temperature beyond uh, one or two for extending onto the fourth day, with the purulent renal uh, discharge, nasal discharge for three to four days, then it is an acute presentation. And this is also one of the scenario of where you should consider sinusitis. Last one is otherwise known as double sickening. This is very important. Usually here, the child presents with respiratory symptoms of daytime cough and URI for around three to four days. The respiratory symptoms continue to persist. The fever usually settles by the fourth day, but recurs again on the seventh day with a spike which lasts along with the respiratory symptoms. So this is called as double sickening or worsening symptoms. So all these are the three types of presentation. Our child whom we discussed in the case scenario one fits into the severe symptom uh, category. So now that you have categorized the presentation of 
sinusitis in children into three groups and having arrived at a diagnosis of a bacterial, acute bacterial sinusitis, what is going to be your approach in managing this child? So, so how will you approach a case of sinusitis? The first thing is you have to consider the scenario in question. The first scenario is it is an upper tract problem. You have to fit the picture. What we mean here is in either of the three scenarios. Second one is sickness level of the child, whether OP or IP admission. Last one is you have to review your diagnosis. And what is the bug, the bacteria in question here? The commonest bacteria causing sinusitis or upper respiratory tract infection is streptococcus pneumonia followed by moraxella and H influenza. However, H influenza is rarer because of good immunization coverage. So the drug of choice here will be amoxicillin, 50 milligram per kg per day for 10 days duration in DD dosage. So this is the, you would take the scene, the bug and the drug. Uh, now, looking at the sensitivity pattern, should we use amoxicillin or amoxiclob? This will be the question in the minds of the listeners. We all know that there is another category where they are for using a higher dose of amoxicillin, say up to 90 milligram per kg per day has been recommended in certain scenarios. For that, the thing which we have to understand is, as Vivek said, H influenza as a causative organism is becoming less and less common because of the widespread immunization. Because the H influenza and Moraxella are two organisms which can produce beta lactamase. So, if you are suspecting that they are involved, which can be known from the fact that the fever and the toxemia is not coming down with 48 to 72 hours of the antibiotic use, amoxicillin, we can use amoxiclav in this situation. On the other hand, it is a streptococcal pneumonia. Here, the mechanism of resistance of the organism is by altering the binding proteins on the cell wall. So, in order to increase the level above the minimal inhibitory level and rationale of giving high dose amoxicillin is to tackle these streptococcus or pneumococcus, which are responsible for this. But if you look at the Indian scenario, the pneumococcus the pneumococcal isolates, which are becoming resistant to penicillin, or more with the meningeal isolate rather than from the respiratory tract. I hope you agree with me. Yes. Right. Uh, what is the role of the second line drugs? Uh, role of second line drugs. Previously, we are using a lot of uh, azithromycin, but however, as uh, Sir just said, no, there is documented. Uh, resistance to pneumococcus or streptococcus pneumonia to azithromycin and moreover azithromycin also is a bacteriostatic drug. So the alternate option is when for example someone has a, a penicillin allergy or an allergy to amoxicillin the alternate option would be you can try sefdinir is a very good option. The dose recommended is 15 mg per kg per day in two divided doses. So sefdinir is a very good option for acute bacterial rhinosinusitis in as a second line drug. So I hope you would uh, agree with. Uh, yeah, yeah. Except in some people prefer cefpodoxine, whatever it is. We will move on to the second case scenario. It's a five-year-old girl, but fever and throat pain, no cough, and you have the classical cervical nodes on either side, and uh, the examination of the throat shows exudate and Enlarged congested tonsils. Can you have the next slide, please? So the listeners can see the classical example of a what is your diagnosis? So there is no marks for this uh, answer. Yeah, it is clear cut. The diagnosis uh, acute exudative follicular uh, acute exudative follicular bacterial tonsillitis. So this is the diagnosis here. No, many a times in our uh, uh, busy office practice, we would have a doubt of whether when to initiate antibiotics. 
should so this is a very important tool you can all have it in your uh, clinical practice as a sheet printed on your uh, office table known as uh, mecca isaac's decision rule so what is the rule here so see you take the age of the child whether the child has cough or not the, the degree of the temperature whether it is more than 38 degrees celsius and tender cervical adenopathy along with tonsillar exudates so each sign and symptom here is given a single point so whenever you have a child who is having more than three of these signs and symptoms or belongs to for example having four points or more than five you can start an antibiotic directly the drug of choice is going to be amoxicillin when the points is less than two it is usually going to be a viral tonsillitis usually they will be associated with the prodrom of a uri some uh, palatal uh, ulcer or an herpangina oral herpangina however the question is whenever there is an intermediate uh, point score that is between 2 to 3 points you have the if you have the facility to do a rapid antigen detection test it's known as radt where the results are available within an hour or so then you can do the test and if it is positive you can proceed to treat the child with amoxicillin however if the result is negative you have to call, confirm by doing a throat culture and if it's negative you are rest assured that it is not a bacterial tonsillitis so could you just tell us now what is this rationale behind the so called uh, rapid screening test for group a diagnostics the american academy of pediatrics have made it imperative that it is mandatory that we should do this test if the facilities are feasible and available prior to initiating antibiotics so there is nothing but the uh, antigen detection test where whenever we take a swab from a pus containing area a throat swab it helps in the detection of the carbohydrate which is present in the membrane the carbohydrate antigen of the streptococcus which is going to be present within the membrane so this is the rational behind the group a streptococcus rapid antigen detection test known as radt so the results come as positive negative and you can treat depending on the same so could you summarize uh, your approach now so summarizing the approach here so we have a seen of an upper tract problem pharyngeal tonsillitis you apply mckay-sachs decision rule review the child the bug is always going to be uh, streptococcus pyogenes pyogenes and pyogenes there is no alternate here the drug of choice is the new recommendation is you give amoxicillin 50 mg per kg per day as a single dose for 10 days and you have to start therapy within 9 days of diagnosis because is earlier the better and you can have you can prevent rheumatic fever though becoming very less now but you have to start therapy within 10 days if there is a penicillin allergy this brings us to the next question see gone are the days when we were all young we used to give oral penicillin no? penicillin b for children below 27 kilos we will give 4 lakhs oral penicillin b for children above 27 kilos will give 8 lakhs per baby. Really. If there is a child that is resistant to amoxicillin or penicillin for that matter, and or there is a child which is not tolerating oral amoxicillin, I think the ideal drug of choice will be a narrow spectrum, first generation cephalosporin, yes. like the cephalexin. Okay. Yes. Can we have the next question? But suppose uh, there is a relapse. So Sorry. in case of a relapse, so what we can do is we can uh, give a combination of amoxiclavulinate because the flora, the, the oropharyngeal flora gets altered as the number of infections tend to increase. So in order to cover the altered oropharyngeal flora we would consider amoxiclav for children who is having acute on chronic tonsillitis or when there is there is recurrence of tonsillitis or very relapse so to summarize with pharyngotonsillitis by using the criteria we can declare as viral 
if it's more than four and you are in thinking in terms of bacterial start the antibiotic immediately if you are in between you are going to do the rapid streptococcal antigen test but after 48 to 72 also hours also the fever is continuing then you are justified in doing a culture before you uh, change the antibiotic or prefer another antibiotic now we move on to the third case scenario a 12 months old infant having a fever of three days duration preceding this child has had a runny nose and now it is incessantly crying cystic examination is normal and uh, when you put your finger on the tragus child cries a lot and then you take your otoscope and have a look and this is the picture what is your so diagnosis uh, diagnosis is uh, starting here commonest uh, thing which we see in uh, office practice so this is a clear cut case of uh, acute otitis media so the, the decision making is very important because uh, they can these infections can rapidly spread to the brain and can result even in a pyogenic meningitis so you have to take the age of the child in question you can classify them as less than 2 years and above 2 years of age you have to see which side is involved whether it is going to be unilateral involvement or bilateral here or not third one severity how will you define severity here is whenever the pain is very severe interfering with the day to day activities when the pain is lasting more than 48 hours or when the temperature is crossing 1 or 2 degrees fahrenheit for more than 48 hours then it is a severe otitis media general clue to start antibiotic is a younger child less than 2 years of age you will definitely start an antibiotic whenever there is a discharging pus from the ear you start an antibiotic the third thing is whenever you have a severe symptoms like uh, the severity criteria is met whatever may be the age of the child you start on antibiotics the only wait and watch approach is when you have a older child with a unilateral involvement or a very or a child in the 4 to 5 year age group with bilateral involvement then you can consider a wait and watch approach now we are going to summarize and uh, could you switch on the next please so summarizing the approach so the scene here is an upper track problem we have made a diagnosis of acute otitis media you will take the age laterality and the severity of the condition the bug is going to be streptococcus uh, pneumonia other conditions other or microorganisms which are going to be associated are moraxella and h influenza which is diminished you know because of the good immunization coverage the drug of choice here is going to be 80 mg per kg per day of amoxicillin for total duration of 10 days should be given in two diluted doses as a bd dosage i have a, a very Uh, pertinent question here to be asked now to sir so we are all having infections we covered uh, pharyngitis tonsillitis amoxicillin and uh, otitis media the, the duration seems to be quite prolonged here for 10 days uh, duration particularly for otitis media also not is there any rational behind this for the prolonged duration we are giving for a local infection we are giving close to 10 days of antibiotic therapy controlled uh, trials randomized or prove that if you want to eradicate the organism at least 10 days of antibiotics have to be given they have compared with 5 day therapy with 7 day therapy and you know sinuses are one situation and ear also the drug has to penetrate into the middle ear fluid in ear infection and for sinus also fortunately we have the same set of organisms you know pneumo moraxella and h influenza so a 10 day antibiotic therapy because of the nearness of the sinus to the brain see we can have a subdural abscess we can get, get a, you know purulent sinusitis complications you know meningitis and to prevent all this mastoiditis to prevent all these complications complete eradication of the organism is demonstrated usually with 10 days of antibiotic therapy is there any role for amoxiclav in this scenario again 
if it is going to be a pneumococcus, nothing much you gain by adding an amoxic cow. But if it is a beta lactamase producing H2 or Metoxella, then probably your amoxic cow will help. It will be a better drug. Shall we move on to the next case scenario? Yeah. Uh, this scenario four, the fourth yeah. scenario. Yeah. A two year old boy has been brought with a short febrile illness. The things which arrest your attention in this child are dysphagia, drooling, muffling of the voice. This toxic. He has an inspiratory strider also. Can I have the next slide? Now, looking at this picture, what's your diagnosis? So, so we have, we have, this is a very acutely unwell child who is sick, toxic, drooling, dysphagia, and uh, the diagnosis is staring here. This is characteristic what is known as a cherry red epiglottis. The diagnosis is uh, an acute epiglottitis here. Uh, currently, the terminology used is people call it as a supraglottitis, acute supraglottitis or acute epiglottitis. So this is the diagnosis here. There are four cardinal features. Whenever a child presents with dysphagia, drooling, with inspiratory strider, and dysphonia, then we usually, with this scenario, we will consider definitely a diagnosis of an unwell, acutely unwell child who is toxic, we will consider diagnosis of epiglottitis. However, drooling dysphagia can also occur in a retropharyngeal abscess as well. But Usually, there is very significant restriction of neck movements in retropharyngeal accents, which is not seen here. And sometimes we do children assuming the characteristic tripod sign where they sit on the chair with their neck extended forward. So the tripod sign can be seen, but these are the four Ds which is associated with supraglottitis or epiglottitis. Fortunately, you don't, the younger generation doesn't see this condition you to get scared prior to the H flu vaccine days. Whenever we saw a child in the casualty, sitting in a tripod posture with the drooling, with the introduction of H influenza, even in the public sector, where the immunization is with a combination vaccine of DPT and HIV, we are seeing lesser and lesser of epiglottitis. The thing which is important in this, it may resemble an acute, no, this, the problem is without a trained person, never attempt to see the upper airway. Upper airway. So we have a case of acute epiglottitis. Summarizing the approach here, the scene is an upper tract problem, supraglottic problem. We have to secure the airway first. An upper airway endoscopy by a trained person is diagnostic and uh, there is no role of an x-ray neck in an acute setting. That's exactly what I was about to say. Uh, you entertained retropharyngeal apsis or parapharyngeal apsis in the differential neck. If you're thinking in terms of a retropharyngeal or a parapharyngeal apsis, then there is point in taking an x-ray where you can compare the soft tissue shadow size to that of the vertebral column. Uh, so the we discussed the commonest organism is going to cause this H influenza and very rarely streptococcus causes uh, this infection. For drug of choice is going to be a third generation cephalosporin, most commonly used is ceftriaxone. The dose of 100 mg per kg per day. Total duration is 7 to 10 days duration in BD form. Once you have extubated the child, child is able to strider is less, child toxemia is reduced, we can switch over to an oral cephalosporin. The total duration of therapy is going to be here. 10 days duration. How will you treat the contacts of these children? Because you may have children who are incompletely immunized or over below two years must be given rifamycin in a dose of 20 milligram per kg per day as a single dose for four days. Incompletely immunized children or unimmunized children whoever is in contact with this particular child should receive rifamycin. Very, very rightly said, Danda. Prior to them, you just warned them about the side effects of uh, rifampicin as well. 
uh, red colored orange colored urine and the sweat also can turn uh, orange just you can mention them prior to initiating prophylaxis for the contact the parents can be uh, reassured once this happens or if you tell them previously also they will be comfortable the next case scenario number five is a four-year-old boy who presents with a low-grade fever, cough, and uh, inspiratory strider. There is a sudden deterioration in his condition. He develops high-grade fever and toxicity, and the strider is increasing in severity. If this had not happened, you would have thought in terms of an acute laryngotracheal bronchitis. But looking at this sick-looking child with a brassy cough, no drooling or dysphagia, unlike the epiglottic. So we have an acutely unwell child with uh, presenting like a crew, but uh, his child is toxic and uh, his child is deteriorating. Child is having an indolent uh, presentation and uh, child is having also a tracheal type of cough here, which is very brassy. So the diagnosis which is going to we are going to consider here is see we when you do a scope because there is an upper airway problem definitely there has been no viral growth so when we proceeded to do a scope for such children what we ultimately found out is the diagnosis was staring see this is a flexible scope of that showing the trachea the lower one third of the trachea where there is plenty of uh, Purulent secretions in the towards the left main uh, bronchus, just lower one third of the trachea, purulent secretions are present, if, arising from both the anterior as well as the posterior walls of the trachea. So, this is a case of acute bacterial tracheitis. So, the key point here is they present like a crook, but child is toxic. They resume, do not respond to conventional management of croup like. Uh, uh, adrenal nebulization and steroids, and they never have a viral prodrome. We will have the summary of how to approach these children with a bacterial tracheitis. So, you have an upper tract problem extending to the lower tract. Sick child, prioritization of the RN and endoscopy is a must here. Prioritization of the RN and endoscopy is very important here. The common bugs associated are Staphylococcus aureus, alpha hemolytic streptococcus, and Haemophilus influenza B, and Moraxella. The drug of choice is going to be ceftriaxone with clindamycin. Ceftriaxone to cover uh, streptococcus as well as Moraxella because we need to have a beta lactamase coverage here. And uh, clindamycin or vancomycin, depending on the hemodynamic status, to cover Staph aureus. The total duration of therapy is going to be 10 days if it is going to be Moraxella, 14 days if it is going to be a Staphylococcus aureus. You will switch over to an oral route once you have extubated the child and child is taking orally well in the absence of fever. Adding on to what Dr. Vivek has just now told, we think of if there is AOM, we think of or sinusitis, we think of the usual organisms HIV, pneumococcus, and noroxella. Here, please think of staph. Looking at the toxemia. And the purulent secretions. I've seen children coughing out purulent secretions in the bacterial tracheitis. Next. So we are midway now. So we are completed around five scenarios. So we'll be proceeding to the sixth case scenario here. A six year old boy presents with a moist cough, which is there for nearly five weeks. The boy is absolutely normal no fever, no weight loss, no nocturnal cough. Clinical examination, but for a few crackles, you don't hear anything in the chest. And you don't have evidence of any suppurative lung disease in the form of clubbing. The X-ray you take, that is also normal. The blood investigations are normal. And what will you think of in such a child? So, so here, the main problem here is a chronic Moist cough. Chronic, we say, because the duration of exceeded beyond four weeks. Moist cough, because it is not a dry, spasmodic, or not a nocturnal cough. So, when you have a, and the examination is normal, except for a scattered Krebs, maybe. And all the relevant investigations have been normal. So, this is a very under-recognized condition, which, which is becoming more common. 
which is known as protracted bacterial bronchitis the diagnostic criteria for what is known as pbb is you should have a wet cough hallmark is wet cough rather than or than a moist cough for five weeks duration at least you should have an identifiable lower airway bacterial infection what we mean by an identifiable is you can do a bronchoscopy but however it is not a practical because the child is going to be very well here not going to have any not child is not going to be sick here and it is not practical so if the child is older and is able to bring out sputum you can identify by doing a sputum culture here a sputum culture or a ball showing a colony count more than 10 to the power of 4 is diagnostic third one is response to antibiotics whenever you diag- make a entertain a diagnosis of pbb it is a diagnosis of exclusion you should see a good response to amoxicillin with clavulinate within two weeks of therapy you have to give therapy for two weeks and you should always it is a diagnosis of exclusion you should always rule out the absence of an alternate specific etiology i just like to add a note here is bronchoscopy or ball is not mandatory here i would like to ask you that you can explain the bronchoscopy so this is uh, studies have been done in the western world where they have done bronchoscopy in such children what they have found out is this is the bronchoscopy of the left lung the the one on the left side is a mucus plug just before the left lower lobe bronchus this is the lingula you see a purulent secretion this is all usually mucus plugging with some uh, purulent secretions are noted in the affected uh, lobes i would like to ask you um i'm in touch with pbb for a last about 10 to 12 years and uh, there were certain speculations that children who have pbb are candidates prone for bronchitis in later life does this theory still hold good uh, the very pertinent question the the answer will be answered in the coming slide once we discuss the approach here the next slide will cover on what uh, sir told here so the scene here is a lower tract problem a problem of chronic moist cough you make a diagnosis of pbb it is a diagnosis of exclusion the, the investigations we have done everything we have ruled out other causes the bug can be staph aureus strep pneumonia and or moraxella it is should the drug or bug should never be a pseudomonas pseudomonas in such children should alert you to investigate extensively especially to rule out cystic fibrosis the drug of choice is going to be your oral amoxicillin with clavulinate for 2 weeks the dose recommended is 50 mg per kg per day in two divided doses for 2 weeks the child is going to be a clinically stable child why we give amoxiclav here is we have to cover h influenza as well as moraxella and amoxiclav will also cover as mssa coverage that is the reason we give amoxiclav for such children prioritize treatment this is a very very important uh, slide which you are uh, seeing here see this is the question which was asked in the previous slide see we have three spectrums pbb chronic separative lung disease and bronchiectasis pbb is the origin of the problem whenever you have a chronic moist cough microbiologically confirmed you have to treat why we need to treat is because the the window for uh, reversibility here is very good here the window for reversibility is very good here we sh- by, by giving two weeks course of antibiotics you are preventing a chronic separative lung disease chronic separative lung disease is nothing but bronchiectasis without radiological features if you don't treat here if the child becomes chronic having a cough for more than moist cough for more than 6 months then they will tend to have radiological evidence of bronchiectasis which is going to be irreversible at this point of time so this is the spectrum pbb to bronchiectasis intermediate we have chronic separative lung disease so we will have the next case scenario that seventh one a five year old boy presents with a cold and cough cold to start with then cough 
for nearly two weeks duration and it is occurring in paroxysms and while you are examining the boy he is coughing and the cough is in paroxysms you see him with red eyes and watering from the eye he is not a known wheezer because generally in those wheezers who have an acute exacerbation you can get a picture like this then it is complicated by a viral infection so what is your diagnosis the important points here are there was a viral prodrome but the cough is prolonging it cannot be a viral infection because the cough has been more than 2 weeks but it hovers over the cough is not only occurring in the day time day and night as well so it cannot be sinusitis the goot occurs in paroxysms and the most important point here is whenever the boy coughs there has been watering and redness of the eyes the most important clue here was the last one watering and redness of the eyes with a boot and with paroxysm so the diagnosis here is pertussis pertussis diagnosis usually the caregiver will witness the boot or the paroxysm when the child is in the within the examination hall sometimes there will be a definite whoop in a young child with apnea or recurrent apnea and with postus vomiting however for sporadic cases like the boy whom we discussed in the previous there is a small algorithm which has been given see whenever you have a cough for more than 2 weeks you will see whether at least one of these symptoms which i am going to mention here are present so what are those symptoms if there is paroxysm or if there is going to be a whoop or if there is going to be a post tussle vomiting so a cough for more than 2 weeks with at least a paroxysm with a whoop or a post tussle vomiting you can entertain a diagnosis of pertussis which is going to be simultaneously supported by absolute lymphocytosis with a low esr if the parents are affordable and if it is feasible you can consider doing a pcr for detection pcr from a nasopharyngeal swab for detection however close mimics should be considered uh, i was about to say that because young children congenital colitis is affected of cough and young children and they are having congenital ingestion is affected of cough we have to think in terms of uh, chlamydia trachomatis and here you will have eosinophilia not an absolute lymphocytosis with esr of course uh, adenoviral infection will be prolonged and you will always see more of a bronchiolytic picture in a young infant and not in an older child mycoplasma pneumonia is another thing that can give rise to paroxysms of cough but then the picture will be a viral interstitial like picture and you will have extra pulmonary manifestation so summarizing the case you have a, the pertussis affects the upper as well as the lower tract because of the ciliated epithelium so you can also have post pertussis or a pertussis pneumonia there is three stages the one is the cataral stage followed by the paroxysmal stage and then the recovery stage so you have to tell the caregiver that the cough is going to be there for close to 3 months another thing is the, the organisms usually are borotella pertussis or borotella parapertussis azithromycin is the drug of choice is going to be given in the dose of 10 mg per kg per day for all age groups or even for infants less than 30 days of age however if the child is going to be more than 1 uh, month of age you can consider clarithromycin as an another option clarithromycin usually given in the dose of 15 mg per kg per day in two divided doses for close to 7 days uh just just want to know do we like uh, treat contacts definitely definitely because we see resurgence of pertussis very many times the five year booster is forgotten by the parents and they may have a younger sibling for whom they wouldn't have uh, given the one and a half year booster so the same azithromycin can be given in the same dose for the same number of days as a treatment for the contacts only thing is when you are treating a very young infant a few words of caution with respect to macrolides clarithromycin and erythromycin 
are supposed to predispose to the development of epitrophic pyloric stenosis, infantile epitrophic pyloric stenosis. Acidromycin is the safest of all the macrolides in such a young infant. Another uh, point which I just like to add before we move on to this. Uh, you have to isolate the child as long as the child is on, going to be on antibiotics here. Yeah. Very important. If there are contacts in the family who have missed their boosters, if they are below the age of seven, you can give the TAP. If they are above the age of nine, probably TDAP will be the ideal immunization. The next case scenario, a three-year-old child presents with fever and cough three days duration, fast breathing, febrile and oral intake is okay. Bronchial breathing is seen in the right, is heard in the right infrascapular region. And when we take the X-ray, you get a picture like this. So the diagnosis. So diagnosis here is. Uh... So you have a child with uh, fever, cough, and fast breathing. It's like showing a right lower low consolidation, lower zone consolidation. So this is a child with community acquired pneumonia with no other warning signs. So the WHO, though the current classification they have classified as uh, pneumonia and severe pneumonia, we still believe that the old classification where we classify them as pneumonia, severe pneumonia, and very severe pneumonia helps us in triaging patients very well. See, we entertain a diagnosis of pneumonia whenever we have fever, cough, and fast breathing. Severe pneumonia, we consider when we have pneumonia with nasal flaring, plus or minus hypoxia, with chest in drawing and vomiting. And very severe pneumonia, we'll consider when we have pneumonia with warning signs like a child with severe distress, grunting, with poor oral intake, significant hypoxia, who is lethargic, unable to feed, and who is severely malnourished. They even have convulsions. They even have convulsions. Hypoxia convulsions. convulsions. And in right upper lobe consolidations, there is an unknown element involved in the convulsions. So, for pneumonia, you can treat it as an OPD basis. The duration of treatment is going to be five days for simple pneumonia, except in a small infant. A small, all infants less than three months should be hospitalized. Severe pneumonia without any obvious red flag signs should receive inpatient care. And no, for children who are going to have very severe pneumonia, you're going to send the child to an, from the ER either to an HD, high, high dependency unit or to an intensive care unit. See, there are a lot many confusions like, see, all fevers, children will have will be tachypne. So there can be an uh, overdiagnosis of uh, pneumonia. Uh, but this simple bedside tool will help us in triaging and make an important uh, finding prior to admission itself. So it's recommended now probably the future papers might uh, include a pulse oximeter as one of the criteria as well. And I find using a big size pulse oximeter in a very young infant invariably doesn't pick up, pick up the signals. There, uh, uh, very, 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 very. In an older child, it's fine. fine. There are, so there are pulse oximeters which are which follows the technology known as Massimo technology, which the hospitals use. So their pickup rates are going to be very good even in an uh, infants. So could you summarize the approach now to your community acquired pneumonia? So, so we have a child who's going to have either pneumonia or severe or very severe pneumonia. Consider the age of the child and the background of the child. The organisms commonly we encounter are all in all age groups are strep pneumonia, H influenza, moraxella catarrhitis, staph pneumonia. And you will consider mycoplasma in an older child or sometimes also in a younger child between two to five years of age. Definitely consider viruses in all age groups if it fits into the clinical picture when they have more of a tracheal bronchial involvement rather than an alveolar involvement. And definitely consider gram-negative bacilli in children less than three months of age. Consider the immunization status of the child. For children who belong to only simple pneumonia, if the child is not a small infant, oral amoxicillin alone is enough for 
five days, 50 mg per kg per day in three divided doses. That is the drug of choice. Because oral amoxicillin is going to cover streptococcus pneumonia and it's still for non-meningeal isolates in our country, resistance to penicillin resistance to pneumococcus is very, very less. It is less than the, the sensitivity is going to be close to 80 to 85 percent. It is only for the non-meningeal isolates that we have a lot of penicillin resistance to pneumococcus. It is only in meningeal isolates. It is only in meningeal isolates. In non-meningeal non isolates, we do not, we do see, not see resistance to... Especially after revision of the cutoff value for IP care. So, correct. IP care, for children less than uh, three months of age, you will definitely consider ceftriaxone or cefetaxime, the child is going to be very young. You will add an aminoglycosate to the regimen to in order to cover gram-negative bacilli. However, if the child is going to be very sick in the ICU, the first drug of choice is going to be, first line itself is going to be a piperazolin plus tazobactam to cover routine organisms as well as for gram-negative, particularly drug-resistant gram-negative bugs. Children between three to four, three months to five years of age, drug of choice is going to be ceftriaxone. You, can, you are also justified in using amoxicillin or amoxicillin with clavulinate acid in this situation because we because of new universal majority are going to be sensitive to pneumococcus for children more than five years of age you will consider ceftriaxone and if the fi picture fits into a mycoplasma like picture in addition to ceftriaxone you are going to use macrolide the point here is macrolides like azithromycin are bacteriostatic and they have high resistance to penicillin so even in an older child, even when you consider atypical pneumonia, macrolide is an addition to ceftriaxone and is not going to be a replacement for ceftriaxone. Total duration for an inpatient care is going to be between 7 to 10 days of therapy, provided it is an uncomplicated pneumonia. And provided it is not staphylococcus. Right. Now we are going to move on to that. When to switch over to oral route is, once the child is febrile for close to 24 to 48 hours and taking orally well non-toxic you can switch over to an oral route when will you consider staphylococcus as the etiological agent in when you are dealing with a pneumonia what are all the other criteria that will take into account both clinical and radiological so staphylococcus pneumonia definitely we will consider under the following scenarios Whenever you have an older child with skin and soft tissue infections, it may be a furuncle, it may be a pustulosis, impetigo, which may be extensive, which may be a pyoderma or any abscess, you will consider staphylococcus in this scenario. When you have a younger child who has had H1N1 and following, during the course of treatment of H1N1 develops rapid fulminant progression with secondary pneumonia, which is bacterial, we will always consider staph aureus in this scenario. When you have a young child sick with a rapid progression with multilobar involvement, you will consider staphylococcus pneumonia. Whenever you have empyema, a complicated pneumonia, you will always entertain pneumococcus as well as staph pneumonia. And whenever you have an empyema with a nematocele or with a consolidation with a nematocele, you will entertain definitely a diagnosis of staph aureus pneumonia. This picture here shows a circumscribed lesion, thin-walled cyst. This is a nematocele. So, summarizing the approach, I think your approach is going to be whether it is an MSSA or an MRSA. Right? Yes. So, what will be your drugs of choice so, when the child is acutely ill and when the child is recovering? So, can you want to switch over to an oral antibiotic? So, when, uh, so, the bug in question here is going to be an either an MSSA or an MRSA. So, IV MSSA, uh, drug of choice is cloxacillin. So, however, we may have difficulty in procuring cloxacillin as generally it is available only in combination with ampicillin. Or nowadays, flu cloxacillin IV is available. The other good option is even for a bloodstream infection is cefazolin, which has good First line, uh, first generation cephalosporin with good MSSA coverage. However, if it's going to be MRSA, 
the drug of choice is going to be clindamycin or linozolid if the child is hemodynamically stable with only a lung involvement however if the child has significant bacteremia is sick in the icu ventilated on inotropes you will definitely consider vancomycin because of its bactericidal activity mssa oral drugs first generation cephalosporins cephalexin is a good oral drug of choice and also amoxicillin with clavulinate acid covers mssa and it is also a good switch over when you are thinking of mssa staph pneumonia whenever you have a mrsa and you are going to switch over the drug of choice is going to be linozolid or clindamycin another advantage of clindamycin is it has anaerobic coverage with also some amount of streptococcus pneumonia coverage as well linozolid kindly monitor the if it's going to be given for a few weeks kindly have a note on the platelet count and sometimes diarrhea can happen occur as a complication of clindamycin though it is rare the duration of treatment here is very important for a mssa infection you give for definitely for 10 days for mrsa 10 to 14 days 2 weeks is recommended however provided they don't have any complications like empyema or an abscess there the duration is going to be extended by even more probably 4 to 6 weeks of duration what is the walking pneumonia sometimes called as atypical pneumonia and what are the common pathogens involved in this and your drugs of choice so uh, walking pneumonia we mean that is the child is going to be stable You're going to come to your uh, office relatively preserved child though they can become sick later on common pathogens encountered are in an older child like definitely consider mycoplasma pneumonia other org organisms are chlamydia in a younger child when there is conjunctivitis with associated maternal infection a very young uh, probably a newborn infection or bacterial pneumonia which is very very rare so drugs of choice will be discussing in the next class uh, next slide so usually the presentation is a walking child the excellent usually you will have more of signs you will have more than symptoms the signs are going to be very less you have more than a lot of symptoms less of signs the excellent is going to going to show only perihilar streaky infiltrates having an interstitial pattern like what we see here so when we deal with atypical pneumonia how is our going to be our approach the scene here is an older child may be younger you will have respiratory and extra respiratory manifestations what do we mean by extra respiratory is they can have mucositis steven johnson syndrome they can have joint involvement hemolytic anemia coombs positive hemolytic anemia where your dct is going to be positive you can have encephalitis you can have lobar consolidations myocarditis you can have effusions very rarely interstitial pattern is commonly seen you can also have effusions and lobar consolidations the bug in question here is usually going to be mycoplasma pneumonia so if you have the facilities you can consider definitely pcr for nasopharyngeal swab however there is a caveat here uh, with the rapid usage of the biofire you have to be very careful because only when the clinical scenario fits you have to consider a pcr nasopharyngeal swab because you might even have for an asymptomatic carrier the nasopharynx can colonize with mycoplasma so the only if the clinical picture fits kindly consider a nasopharyngeal swab for pcr however if someone is not able to afford a pcr for nasopharyngeal swab what are the options is you can consider convalescent sera antibody titer of igg at diagnosis at the end of the first week and four weeks later where you can demonstrate a four fold rise in igg and other things which can be done or cold agglutinin if still the patient is not able to do you can just do a bedside dct or a cold agglutinin test where you will develop antibodies to your rbc membrane because of the hemolytic anemia the recommendations are the drug of choice is going to be macrolides these are bugs which do not have a cell wall so we have a bacteriostatic drug that is enough azithromycin 5 to 7 days duration 10 mg per kg per day on day 1 and you can continue it for the next 4 to 7 days the other alternate options are going to be clarithromycin dose as we discussed previously is going to be 15 mg per kg per day for 
10 days in two different doses. Is there any macrolide resistance reported by these atypical organisms? So, when to consider macrolide resistances? So, you have initiated treatment. Within 48, 48 hours of initiating macrolide therapy with the appropriate dose, if the fever and the does not settle down or if the child develops complications like extension of the consolidation or development of effusions, then you will be able to demo, you have to consider macrolide resistance. Macrolide resistance has been sequenced extensively in Japan. And uh, the drugs you have to consider is whenever you have to you are having a diagnosis of endocrine pneumonia with macrolide resistance, you have to switch over to a alternative regimen oxys. Doxycycline for an older child or for a younger child, you can consider levofloxacin. Fluoroquinolones is a very good option. It is a respiratory quinolone and is going to be very effective in this scenario. After the use of doxycycline in scrub typhus, now American Academy of Pediatrics has revised the age group for which doxycycline can be used. But experience with levofloxacin in a very young um, age group is not yet fully available. So we'll come on to the next case scenario. Number nine. So a two-year-old child. You would like to announce something? Yeah, we we'll have a two-year-old child here. Yeah. With high grade fever of five days duration and respiratory distress suddenly. Child has got a poor oral intake, febrile, toxic looking with attractions everywhere, grunt, and you are able to see reduced air entry on the right side. The entire right lung, you are not able to hear the air entry. Can we have the x ray? This is the scenario that you commonly come across while treating a pneumonia, also, and where you have to consider the complications. So, the diagnosis here is we have a toxic child with grunt, distress, with a hemithorax, which is completely opacified, particularly obliteration of the cost of any angles. So this is a case of right-sided empyema here. So how will you approach a case of uh, empyema? See, the scene here is you have a problem with the lower tract. The child is a toxic child. So it is a problem of empyema. We have to consider the hemodynamic status. The bug which you should concentrate here is going to be pneumococcus. Definitely you have to consider staph aureus, which is going to be either MSSA or MRSA. Very rarely, it is going to be hemophilus influenza with good immunization coverage. We are very rarely seeing H influenza. And could be streptococcus also is a rare occasion. So the rationale behind choosing the drug here is going to be streptoxone strept with clindamycin. So streptoxone is going to cover MSSA and going to cover pneumococcus. Clindamycin is going to cover MRSA and also has a good anaerobic coverage and it has very good toxin reduction effect. So that is the rational in choosing ceftriaxone with clindamycin, provided the child is going to be hemodynamically stable. A bacteremic child sick on the ventilator with inotropes, you will definitely consider vancomycin instead of clindamycin. So this is how you treat the bug here. What is the duration? of your treatment in a child with empyema. So the duration of treatment totally is going to be minimum four weeks. Sometimes you can extend it to up to five to six weeks. The main thing here is that pleural thickening is established. And uh, during follow-up, the X-ray takes sometimes may take a little longer time, even three to four weeks to resolve completely. So follow-up recommendations, if you, there is ultrasound is a very good tool, which will demonstrate only Plural thickening which with no active consolidation. So it can be used as a reliable follow-up tool. Will you use an intercostal drainage alone or you will use a fibrinolytic along with an intercostal drainage tube? If you have instituted the intercostal drainage tube, what is the duration for which you keep the drainage tube? These are all some of the questions which the listeners would like to know. This is a very, very important question. See, the whole dictum is whenever there is pus in the body, you have to remove the pus. Small, however uh, small or big it may be. So 
current recommendations are that when the child presents early to the hospital the first option is going to be apart from antibiotics when you drain the pus you have to insert an small bore intercostal tube drainage and send for analysis simultaneously you have to use instill fibrinolytics because this is when the child comes here when there is empyema it is usually in the stage 2 which is the fibrino proliferative stage so we have to in addition to using intercostal tube drainage we have to use fibrinolytics to break the fibrin and the commonly used fibrinolytics are urokinase or streptokinase bd dosage usually given for 3 days the other option is with the child within 48 hours of instilling or giving this treatment of icdt with fibrinolytics if the child is not going to improve or worsens in the next 48 hours then you will consider early vats in this scenario if the lung expansion is not good generally we remove the tube when the brain age is less than 15 mm yes child is a febrile and the lung expansion is good what is the role of vats 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 is the child is vats has a role definite role in two indications when the child does not lung has not expanded when the pus is continuously draining lung and when there is clinical no improvement in clinical status or deterioration with icdt with fibrinolytics you will consider vats for children presenting beyond the first week or well into the second week ninth or tenth day when already significant adhesions and multi loculations have developed there is you have to do an icdt but you definitely have to there is no going to, going to be no role of fibrinolytics you have to definitely take the child for a vats without any delaying further because you have to i think loculated effusion and chronic empyema straight away work well, for it for there is no place for icdt agreed we we'll come to the last case scenario a four and a half year old with a febrile illness of 7 days duration with respiratory distress and cough comes and you are able to hear bronchial breathing in the right axilla child has got a respiratory distress they have got a grunt and you take an x-ray and you have x-ray please you see a scenario like this So, so we have a child who has presented with a common day acquired pneumonia, but the duration is quite prolonged. Here, close fever has been close to seven week, days. Seven days. Child is toxic and has bronchial breathing, but we expected a pneumonia with probable complications. But we ended up with a complicated pneumonia. What we see here is we see a thick walled cyst or thick walled cavity with an air fluid level. So this is the typical picture of a lung abscess which is presenting here in the right mid zone so ct helps for better delineation ultrasound also will help in detection ct helps for better delineation of the anatomy so when we proceeded to take a ct we found out the same thing thick walled nematocele rumor has a thin walled cyst but however lung abscess has a thick walled cyst a cavity with an air fluid level within a consolidation so we see the ct scan here the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus so this is the cuts of the middle lobe so right middle lobe lung abscess here we see so so we have a problem of lung abscess the next question which comes to our mind always is whether it is a primary lung abscess or it is going questions. to be a secondary no, lung abscess like questions thing. whether it is a primary or a secondary questions lung abscess types. complication of a pneumonia primary lung abscess are usually associated with a complicated pneumonia they usually have only a pulmonary infection as a primary source can involve usually the upper lobes or the epical segments of the lower lobes and they have a very good prognosis secondary lung abscess here yeah. secondary lung abscess usually you always have a coexisting lung disease that means you can have a sequestration of the lung or a cecum of the lung which has infected and become an abscess or you can have a bronchial obstruction anywhere which leads to abs abscess immunodeficiencies and aspiration pneumonia particularly in children with neuromuscular disorders are all conditions associated with secondary lung abscess in this case the treatment wise 
is going to be the same except that we have to cover unusual organisms here in the secondary abscess but it is always the prognosis is going to be related to the underlying condition so summarizing the approach uh, you can consider it as an unresolving pneumonia or the treatment is going to be whether it is a primary lung abscess or a secondary lung abscess yes whether it is secondary to the organism is going to depend upon whether it is a community acquired pneumonia like a pneumococcal pneumonia or it's a necrotizing pneumonia like a staphylococcal pneumonia or a klebsiella pneumonia or is it an anaerobic infection as it happens in mentally retarded children with a palatopharyngeal incompetence secondary to aspiration and or it is a pseudomonas or a fungus because of immunodeficiency in the child so what will be your antibiotic of choice so you consider the scenario here is an unresolving pneumonia complication or any underlying lung issue is there then we get to see next thing is you will see whether it's a primary or a secondary lung abscess usually primary lung abscess the bugs are pneumococcus staph aureus it may be mssc or mrsa or klebsiella for secondary lung abscess in addition to these we usually also have to consider anaerobes fungi and pseudomonas so the drug of choice is going to be here ceftriaxone with clindamycin and if there is bacteremia or clindamycin resistance we have to consider vancomycin if you are dealing with a problem of uh, pseudomonas in an immunosuppressed child or with a secondary lung abscess drug of choice is going to be piperazolim with tazobactam in addition to staph coverage so piptas and vanco will be a uh, very good choice there or piptas and clindamycin for a secondary lung abscess what is the duration of the treatment in a lung abscess the duration of treatment usually for a lung abscess is going to be 6 weeks one important thing is there are a lot of other options medical management still continues to remain the Manage, foremost and the first thing we, we, we will consider surgery only as the last resort pitel catheters ultrasound guided aspiration or surgical measures vats are all considered only when medical therapy fails and regarding re repeat of imaging if the child is clinically well improved responding to antibiotics you will repeat a ct scan only at the end of completion of the treatment and interval scan is not going to help in the management so having come to the end of the session i would like to give some take home message for the listeners consider the organism and the susceptibility of the organism in question to the antibiotic the age of the child and the severity of the illness the history of previous treatment and hospitalization along with the immune and nutritional status of the child thank you all very much for a patient listening and uh, we'd like to take the questions one by one thank you hello if you are uh, giving the intravenous for uh, lung abscess uh, a uh, treatment uh, is it advisable to send them with venflon after the initial course is over uh, sir sir uh, uh, come sir i think your uh, voice is uh, not uh, heard well okay, is it possible to type one can you just repeat your question sir no in the initial phase of uh, treatment for lung abscess and other uh, invasive treatment where you are giving suppose yes, the intravenous course is over about for one week or 10 days Okay. Is it advisable to send the patient with venflon, where it can be given outside the treatment? Uh, with regards to what scenario, sir, for an abscess or for a routine pneumonia or a effusion, which 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 scenario you are specifically asking, sir? Yeah, even for a pneumonia and other things. Ah. If it is yeah, if it is very severe, that we are going to definitely give intravenous only as an inpatient. okay sir suppose if the patient is apparently normal the other parameters have become normal only yes, injection sir. has to be continued for a week or so how far yes, it is advisable to send them with venflon sir sir uh, with uh, regards to your uh, question sir tot for a simple pneumonia requiring hospitalization the total duration of treatment is going to be 10 days sir. so if the child 
is within 40 within 24 hours the fever has settled child is very well alert you can switch over to oral antibiotics itself and discharge the child home i would like to budge in uh, there are some circumstances where the parents cannot afford a prolonged hospital stay child has come with a severe pneumonia but has become a febrile within about 48 hours and your intuition says that it will be better if you continue the iv antibiotics for about five or six days so we do start a fresh one flock and send them home provided we are confident that the parents can take care of the one flock without sepsis and bleeding then we can switch over to oral antibiotics for the next five days fine mm -hmm. uh, with regard to a question which has been posted by dr pushkala she has, i'll read out the question for the benefit of other, others whenever there is no contact history and a patient with pneumonia when should you consider tuberculosis and what are the investigations indicated? See, uh, the criteria to tell us tuberculosis is whenever you have a fever for more than two weeks with a cough, that which we call it as a cough, which is persistent, day and night cough for more than two weeks with weight loss, with or without contact. When the symptoms are going to get, and the child is not going to be acutely unwell, then you will consider a, a tuberculosis. Primary investigations is going to be a chest X-ray, man two, and then resting gastric juice or an induced putum, CB nat. TB quantiferon gold, more used in the Western world and is currently not used as the modality or initial investigation of choice in uh, children who are having suspected tuberculosis. However, with regard to your question, when you have a child whom you have treated, but the pneumonia is not resolving, for example, the patch is persisting clinically and radiologically. Even after good therapy, the child is well. Persisting. Even in the absence of contact, we would, it is definitely recommended to screen and investigate for tuberculosis, which is going some many a times we come across this scenario as well. The only difference between Manto and Quantiferon Gold is that Quantiferon Gold is not influenced by your BCG vaccine. However, and another one another one single advantage is that they are going to get the results on the same day in other words it is not going to be superior at all and you will have unresolving pneumonias where you should work up for tuberculosis sir, as well this is I, I hope i have answered your question there is another question from dr j k shankar indication for intercostal drainage in empyema sir any child with effusion with empyema when we put a Diagnostic tap when we see pus, the next question is you have to put an intercostal drainage. However, when you have a fluid which is going to be less than one third of the hemithorax or an ultrasound, when the sonologist tells that the fluid is going to be only less than 15 to 20 ml, there is no role for an intercostal tube drainage there. When one third of the hemithorax is opacified and the, where the pus is significant, more than a, 70 to 80 or even 100 ml, then an ICD is definitely warranted. Small effusions, hemithorax, where when one only only 10 ml or less than only one third of the hemithorax is occupied, there is no role for ICD. But plus significant amount, next next thing which you are going to do is insert an intercostal tube. Any other uh, questions? If there are no further questions, we would like to close the session. Thank you all very much for a patient hearing and active participation. Good day to you. Thank you. Thank you.